Welcome to the 2021 Governor's Humanities Awards hosted by Humanities Montana. We're so excited to have you with us for the first ever fully accessible virtual Governor's Humanities Awards. I'm Randy Tanglin, Executive Director of Humanities Montana and the host of tonight's festivities. And I'm Carla Homestead, Vice Chair of the Board of Directors. Welcome. Thank you for joining us to celebrate and honor our five Governor's Humanities Award recipients, Dorothy Bradley, Janine Pease, Jim Robbins, Jim Scott, and Christy Smith. As we gather virtually for the, for, for the Governor's Humanities Awards, we do so from all corners of the land we now call Montana. Montana was the traditional homeland and common hunting grounds of several tribes, including the Assiniboine, Blackfeet, Chippewa Cree, Crow, Grovon, Kootenai, Little Shell, Northern Cheyenne, Pondere, Plains Cree, Salish, Sioux, Hidatsa, Mandan, and Arikara. This land today is home to 12 sovereign tribes with over 67,000 enrolled members. Those of us who are not indigenous acknowledge we are settlers on this land. We have people from all over the state of Montana and the country joining us virtually to celebrate our five Governor's Humanities Award recipients. This evening, we are coming to you from Missoula, Montana, specifically Missoula's Community Resource Studio at the brand spanking new Missoula Public Library. We acknowledge we are in Salish and Ponderay homelands. We offer our respect for their history and culture and for the path they have always shown us in caring for this place for generations to come. We want to check in with you, so please put your zip code in the chat or click on the native land map link we've dropped in there to identify the indigenous land you are joining us from. I'm so excited to see that we're being joined by people from all over the state and the country. It is my pleasure to now introduce Mike Jetty, an enrolled member of the Spirit Lake Dakota Nation and a Turtle Mountain Chippewa descendant. Mike is a singer and actively participates in cultural celebrations and ceremonies. He also likes to hit the powwow trail with his family. He is here today to offer a traditional Dakota prayer song to honor the Governor's Humanities Award recipients. <laughs> Hello, my relatives. I greet all of you with a heartfelt handshake. My name is Mike Jetty, a member of the Spirit Lake Dakota Nation and a Turtle Mountain Chippewa descendant. And I'm really humbled today to offer up a, a song for all these amazing individuals and their contributions to the state of Montana. But when I greeted you, I greeted you with a traditional Dakota greeting. Hello, my relatives. And my dad always said, Mike, always greet people as relatives. And I asked him why. And he said, well, that way you can hit them up for cash later on. So there's an old Indian trick for you. But uh, I just thought I'd offer up a song and on behalf of all of you. And this song is an encouragement song. And just to um, thank you for all the encouragement and, and um, inspiration you give all of us here in Montana. So... Yeah, 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 yeah
And so I want to say uh, whoopi da tanka, a big thank you to all of you out there. And I'll just leave you with this piece of advice. Uh, when I was younger, my dad said, Mike, you should never criticize someone until you've walked a mile in his moccasins. And I asked my dad why. And he said, well, that way you can be a mile away, plus you got his moccasins. And so I wish you uh, continued success out there, and, and thank you for all you do. So that's it, too. Mike, thank you for your words of wisdom and the wonderful tribute to our honorees this evening. I would like to offer our most sincere gratitude to those who made the 2021 Governor's Humanities Awards possible. Thank you to our awards committee for your leadership and for all your behind the scene work, for behind the scenes work. Thank you to the entire Humanities Montana staff, especially Sarah Stout, Sierra Cornelius, and Ryan McCarty. Thank you to Imagination Media for producing the event tonight. And thank you to our event sponsors without whom we wouldn't be here. Laura Mitchell Ross and John Walker Ross, David and Jan Dietrich, Caroline and Don Bitts, the Montana History Foundation, Preserve Montana, Rocky Mountain College, Montana Public Radio, Montana PBS. And thank you to every single person who has already made a gift to Humanities Montana. Your support makes it possible for us to serve communities and gr through grants and special programs that reach into every corner of our state, as well as to celebrate the vital work of these five individuals. That's right, Carla, and people can still donate. There is a link in the video description and chat. The money we raise today will go right back into making the public humanities available in Montana's communities. Carla, thank you for helping us kick off the celebration tonight and for all you do for Humanities Montana. Thank you, Randy. Thank you for having me. I sincerely hope you'll join me and support Humanities Montana by clicking on the link in the chat. I'll be back later, but please enjoy the ceremony. I offer my heartfelt congratulations to all the honorees and their families. Thank you, Carla. If you've been to a Governor's Humanities Awards event in the past, let us know in the chat. And I think I even see some of our previous award recipients in the virtual audience tonight. We'd love to hear from you right there in the chat. But if you're new to the award ceremony or Humanities Montana, I'd like to give you a little bit of background. Humanities Montana is the state affiliate for the National Endowment for the Humanities. Since 1972, we have served Montana's communities through stories and conversation, and we do this by providing programs that tell Montana's diverse stories. By supporting Mon Montana's cultural institutions through grants and by facilitating conversations about the most pressing issues of the day. Humanities Montana has been doing this work for a while now, 49 years to be exact, and my words just can't do justice to the impact the humanities have in our lives, so I've asked a few friends to join us. It's not a return to what was, it's a new beginning for a community, a realization that things were going in the wrong direction and that the only way to get to a resolution is to do it together. That being separate has never, never been the plan in Montana and it can't be now. Humanities Montana is the State Council for the National Endowment for Humanities for the last 49 years. It brings to the forefront history and culture that you're not going to find in history books. Humanity of Montana really has the, the, the breadth of the state uh, to work with. It provides funding and opportunity grants uh, for speakers and, and programming to, to come into different communities and to share specifically from a historical perspective through community conversations. They can hit on current events that helps communities tell their own story. They have dedicated staff that are able to design and develop programming that, that can fit a community's needs. And Montana is such a different state. Eastern Montana is so different from Western Montana. You have a culture in the North and a culture in the South. 
And I think Humanities Montana can be a bridge for all of these different networks to have conversations with each other. We live in a time where there's a lot of hate boiling in our country and there's div division and, and there's a lot of um, hate even within individuals where they just don't like themselves very much. And we don't see ourselves in other people. And that is where Humanities Montana can come in and, and create these conversations. And they open us up to embrace our own stories and embrace the stories of other people and can really create beautiful change in communities and in schools and in youth and in all of us. And that work deserves support. But there's always more than one side um, to a story. And I think that in a world where now you can get your news um, in the blink of an eye, um, the humanities help you kind of look at you know, what you're being fed and, and think critically about it. Native Americans in Montana shouldn't have to dig or fight to find out what their cultural stories are or who they are, where they come from. You, you know, the Bitterroot Salish, you know, we have our story of being moved from the Bitterroot to the Flathead Reservation. Didn't know that. Humanities Montana has done a really great job with reaching out to the Native communities of Montana. Whenever there is a grant opportunity available, they will reach out to the tribal colleges, to the tribes themselves, to just let everybody know what's available and how to apply. I think you support the humanities because you, you realize how important it is for yourself. But you also understand that the humanities is a community issue. It's a place where resolution can be found for people. And that should not be reliant on commercial success. It is something that should rely on philanthropy and the government to help everyone have the opportunity of what the humanities can offer. When you support Humanities Montana, you're supporting communities around the state. Uh, a large portion of what Humanities Montana does is financially supporting our state's cultural institutions, from small public libraries to cultural centers and even book clubs in rural areas. Humanities Montana is dedicated to building a sense of community in our state. Your financial support makes a huge difference. If you're thinking about giving to Humanities Montana, do it. The money that is given by private donors can take Humanities Montana so much farther into these rural communities, into the libraries, into and, and programs that can be designed specifically for people who are interested in learning the history and culture in a unique way, in a fun, unique way. As you heard, Humanities Montana sparks conversations, builds community, and strengthens civic engagement. And that's what I hope happens for all of you who are joining us this evening. This is truly an empowering day for us. To us, the Governor's Humanities Awards underscore the power of the humanities by recognizing inspiring individuals whose work encourages communities to be stronger, resilient in the face of divisions, and confident in coming together over the most pressing issues. And we aren't the only ones to think this. Each award recipient was nominated by their peers and selected from individuals from across the state of Montana. And here with us this evening to share more about this year's Governor's Humanities Awards honorees is the governor himself. Please join me in welcoming Governor Greg Gianforte. Good evening and welcome to the 2021 Governor's Humanity Awards. It's always a privilege to recognize the service of Montanans. This is the 26th year of this award and I'm honored to be the fifth governor to bestow this recognition. First, I'd like to express my sincere gratitude to each honoree on behalf of the governor's office. I'm amazed at the creativity and perseverance of this group and their leadership. Now I'm honored to announce this year's Governor's Humanity Award honorees. Dorothy Bradley of Clyde Park, Dr. Janine Pease of Billings, Jim Robbins of Helena, 
Jim Scott of Billings and Christy Smith of Belgrade. Each of you dedicated yourselves to something greater than yourselves, growing and strengthening your communities and our state. Service is at the heart of our Montana values, and we're here to celebrate that spirit of service this evening. You have built your legacies through enduring philanthropy, indispensable journalism, language revitalization, decades of service to your state, and teaching us the power of our words. Your impact will be felt for years to come. I also want to send a special thank you to all of the nominators. This ceremony could not have happened without you. It is truly an honor to join Humanities Montana to celebrate your selfless dedication. I applaud you. Thank you, and please enjoy the rest of the ceremony. Thank you, Governor Gianforte, for taking time out of your busy schedule to celebrate the 2021 Governor's Humanities Award winners. Our first awardee this evening has served Montana since 1971. Elected to the Montana House of Representatives as the only woman serving at the time, Dorothy Bradley spent a total of 14 years in the state legislature, finding time in the middle of all of that to earn her Juris Doctor degree. Her brilliant political career inspired her to edit and co-author the volume to make a better place for this and future generations, a look back at the exciting world of Montana politics in the 1970s. I would love to be the first to congratulate Dorothy, but we have a few people who wanted to share their appreciation before me. The thing I want to point out is that she represented a new breed of legislators. Uh, that I think is really important. New politicians that clearly were concerned about the environment and people, individuals. Well, I think her 50 years of service to Montana is evidence enough about why and the really good, positive things that she did. And then I think her, um, of course, what she did with the new book that was out about the environmental uh, leaders in the country, in the state, doing um, a lot of re recollection of those progressive days during the Constitutional Convention. The title is To Make a Better Place for This and Future Generations. And what Dorothy did was have many, many people, most of whom were in the legislature, discuss the Constitution. And it was very nostalgic. I know the other delegates there aren't very many of us left of the hundred, but those of us who are left uh, really would treasure this book because it brings back what happened all those years ago. She has friends everywhere uh, on both sides of the political aisle because they recognize her as a woman of exceptional intellect, uh, unbelievable uh, empathy and concern for her fellow human beings, and somebody who just um, with grace and strength uh, has served um, the people of Montana um, over these uh, last five decades in a way that I don't think um, could be replicated by anybody else. And I want to thank Dorothy, and I want to thank Dorothy for all she's done all these years. She set a perfect example for how we should behave as community leaders and as legislators. And her adversaries, as well as her supporters, really respected Dorothy and still do. And so I'm very honored to be a part of this process. Nothing could be greater pleasure than to see Dorothy receive this award, which she certainly deserves. But I think for me and the thousands of Montana women who benefited from your service, I want to especially say thank you for um, me, my two daughters, and my granddaughter for the things you've done for us and will continue to benefit Montana in the years to come. And uh, I love you a lot. Oh my goodness. I knew this would be the hard part. Thank you for those absolutely incredible words. This is a great party. And I'm just, my only sorrow is that we're not all together in a great big room and hugging and celebrating and passing the bottle of champagne. Uh, 
thank you for tuning in because it makes it extra hard. And huge thanks to my nominators for this award and to the dedicated humanities team and to Governor Gianforte. I have always known and endlessly, endlessly said that the greatest gift in life is to be able to make a contribution. And accolades are kind of peripheral. But that said, when I received a call that told me I was a 2021 recipient of the Humanities Award, I think I walked around the house for two hours until my face was just exhausted from smiling. Recognition from Humanities Montana is as good as it gets. And again, thank you. I appreciate that Humanities Montana came into being in the 1970s because that's when I made my own wild leap into Montana politics. And it's the decade I chose to honor by collecting stories from my colleagues. It was an amazing splash of time. There was so much imagination and boldness and almost like an immersion in public policy. What Humanities Montana stands for is inspiring people to be involved in our democracy. And that's what we had in the 70s. Uh, I think maybe our only shortfall was that we thought this would be a way of life forever. And we now know that we can't take this kind of thing for granted. A couple of years ago, someone said to me, what's the coal trust? Well, I was aghast, but it brought home the fact that what we call the glory days were becoming history. And it's time to stop referring to the new constitution because it's 50 years old. But it was a time of such inspiration that we should not let the glory days disappear just because the last activist is gone. We were ordinary people. We rose to the occasion and we made Montana a better place together. I was able to round up 20 of these people and get their stories. It took a lot of cajoling and pushing and being bossy. And we got them all down in print in their own words. And my goodness, the memories just came pouring out. Yes, about the coal trust and the coal tax, Tom Tao and strip mine reclamation and hard rock and stream access and water use and subdivisions and the constitution. And these stories are absolutely remarkable. But what is more remarkable is what you read between the lines. Crusading for Montana was not rude. It was not personal and it was not partisan. To be sure, we fought those visionary laws down to the last word, but it was not a clashing of values because we are all connected to the land. Nobody has a corner on loving Montana the most. And it was not personal because that foundation was absolute bedrock in our being able to trust and respect each other. Thanks to the law school at the University of Montana, that collection is in print. I wanted to make sure they were out there across the state and with some help, we have made sure that collection is in every Montana library. At the back of my mind, I have, I have this vision that a young person will pick up a copy someday, maybe around 22, like I was when I was on fire. And maybe they will be riveted by a homemaker who took on the entire Montana tobacco lobby or a 23 year old widow who wrote the preamble of the constitution or a conservative businessman whose cabin was burned down because he advocated wild rivers. And maybe that person will pick up the banner. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dorothy. Our next awardee is a MacArthur Fellow, a National Indian Educator of the Year, 
a winner of the ACLU Jeanette Rankin Award, and now a Governor's Humanities Award recipient. The founding president of Little Bighorn College, Dr. Janine Pease, has provided visionary leadership to Montana's tribal colleges and Native American education and is a crucial voice for Native language revitalization. Janine has had a nationwide impact on the humanities through her service on the National Advisory Council on Indian Education and the Thank White House Initiative on Tribal Pacific. Colleges and Universities Advisory Council, both presidential appointments. I'd like to welcome some of Janine's friends and colleagues to be the first to congratulate her. Uh, this is a very well-deserved award for for Dr. Pease. She's had a lifetime of contributions, not only to her home community on the Crow Reservation, but to the broader span of education, both on and off the reservation, and also inspiring other Native American groups to, to do similar things. Uh, she's been an advocate for, um, for education. She's been an advocate for indigenous peoples. Uh, more recently, she's been an advocate for not only the preservation, but the revitalization of particularly the Crow Indian language. With, with the work that she has done through the, uh, the Chickadee Lodge and the Crow Language Consortium. And so I think she has demonstrated over many years, her commitment to advancing the condition or the improvement of, of peoples in, in Montana and particularly on Indian reservations. There are a thousand reasons why Janine deserves that award, but I think more than anything else, it helps to show the young people on the Crow tribe that someone can rise up to achieve great things and be recognized throughout the state and throughout the West and that, I believe, will help many young people among the Crow to achieve even greater things than they would otherwise have done. I saw her at the International Language and Culture Preservation Conference in Pachanga two years ago. And I was so grateful and excited to see her. And we, she invited me to come and sit down with her at her table and we were visiting and she was talking to me and once again just beautifully giving me advice not in a demanding kind of way but in a very loving way and she held my hand and she was talking to me and she took off her earrings and she placed them in my hand right at that moment when she placed those earrings in my hand they called her up to receive the Lifetime Achievement Award. And I just cried and I said to myself, what a beautiful woman to be thinking about me and be so giving to give me her elk tooth earrings at a time when she was going to be receiving an award, a Lifetime Achievement Award for all of the work that she's done for the language and cultural preservation for the Crow people. And when she received that award and she got up and she once again, like all the other awards that she received, she gave credit to so many other people for the accomplishment that she made. And as Native American people, we believe that the things that we do not only affect us as individuals, but our family, our entire tribe and Indian people everywhere. And I feel like over the years since I've known her, she truly emulates that characteristic and that value that I've always been taught about who we are as Native people and who she is as a Native woman. Hello, Dishoda, the Chick Delome, 
Valesha Akchuagi Dejich. My name is one who loves to pray. I'm from the Crow Nation. I'm really happy to join you this evening. I am happy to accept this award and thank you so much for all of your kind words, you all. My involvement with the humanities goes back. It's a lifelong romance. From the 1950s, when I began performing with my family, my siblings, Ben and Joel and Linda, and my parents, right up to today when I'm studying about the students, the Crow Indian students who went to Carlisle. And I realize that the humanities have given me a tremendous number of gifts, too many really to count. Gifts in beauty, beautiful movement, language, ideas, and a deeper sense of the past. <clears throat> <clears throat> Most everything I've done in the humanities has been in collaboration and in partnerships with many people from Little Bighorn College, from my own community, the um, uh, Valley of the Chiefs, from the Crow Language Consortium and the Language Conservancy, and also with support that's very, very important, the National Endowment from the Humani for the Humanities, Humanities Montana, the Administration for Native Americans, and Montana Indian Languages Program. Well, beauty entered my living space at a very early age. I came to appreciate the utter beauty of absoluca regalia and exquisite horse trappings that are so important and so typical to the absoluca people. All my life, I've held in awe the site of Crow Fair, the encampment of 1,200 lodges and all the families that live in them. And among the dreams I shared with others was a place and a space for a college. And we dreamt, we thought of great places we'd love to be, and eventually it came to pass, campus master plan, and a campus in Crow Agency for a tribal college and for the students that came there to study, that had Crow designs and that was oriented to the four geographic poles of Crow country. And of course, beautiful movement has graced my 70 years I so enjoy participating in the parade dance of the Crow Nation, the Dance of the Seasons, with 500 other Crow tribal members, men and women, boys and girls, around the Crow Fair encampment, and to hear the gorgeous songs and to see all of the encampments. I enjoyed performing with my peas, my family, my siblings, and my parents. I participated in dancing contests and athletic and traditional competitions, especially at All American Indian Days in Sheridan, Wyoming from 1953 to 1978. And I'd love to observe team dancing of the Absaluka hot dancers, especially when my brothers, my son and my nephews, my daughters, my sister are participating as team members. Language, of course, is a marvelous gift for communication, for giving the knowledge of the generations to those, those new members of our families. I myself had the privilege of listening to my parents, Ben and Marjorie, my aunts and uncles and many elders in my tribe to listen to their stories, to hear of their traditions and to share in their many adventures. And I had the privilege of performing with colleagues at Rocky Mountain College in a reader's drama called Stoneheart that dramatized the experience of young Sacagawea uh, of the Corps of Discovery. I treasure the Absaloka language as it brings us all the worldview of the Absaloka people, all the thousands of years of heritage and it's been a privilege to serve as a principal of Chickadee Lodge and see the learning that children can have in a language immersion school. I also was privileged to be the coordinator 
of the um, Rapid Word Collection Project in which 65 elders, all fluent speakers, brought their knowledge like in a set of encyclopedias to Crow Agency and to St. Charles Mission in Prior. And we collected 15,000 words in our language. And that work has resulted now in an online dictionary that's free for everyone to use. What a treasure, our language. And also to approach big ideas. The humanities challenges us to think big, ideas that are of great consequence. For me, I joined others in recognizing the intelligence of Crow Indian people the intelligence that they could become Crow Indian students, college students, in a college right in Crow Agency. And we imagined it. And over the years, it had, has come to pass. We place the Crow humanities right at the heart of the college curriculum. The Crow history, the history of the chiefs, Crow Indian kinship, the language, songs, and dances. And yes, they met our general education requirements and we negotiated transferring those to the university system. And the idea of questioning the boundaries of school board districts, hardened school board district and the county commissioner zones that discriminated against Crow and Cheyenne voters and to change the election scheme from at-large election schemes. And from the humanities, I have come about a very brilliant and deeper sense of the past, as we inherit so much from our parents and grandparents and all those who have come before us. I deeply appreciate the tribal historians collections that now are in the tribal college archives at Little Bighorn College. Annie Bigman, Eloise Pease, and Dr. Joseph Medicine Crow, all of whose collections I have benefited from. And I have participated as a faculty member in an oral history project that collects the voices and the experiences of Crow Indian people from the 1950s and the 60s to hear about relocation in industrial centers in the West and Midwest, to understand the experience of discrimination that Crow and Cheyenne voters had at the polling places in Bighorn County, and to hear about a student who had to petition to enroll in a US history class at Edgar High School, and finally to learn almost firsthand from of Minnie Reed Williams, who was the first Crow Indian woman elected to tribal office and who organized the Women's Federated Club. And to the study the records of 90 Crow Indian students who enrolled at Carlisle Industrial Indian School in Pennsylvania, to look at their letters and read their grade records, to come to know that three of them died and are buried there, to know that 12 graduated and seven more ran away from Carlisle. And finally, to join a group, a convocation of tribal scholars and historians who are writing a Crow history book for youth, for high school and college students that recognizes notable persons and names the eras in Crow history. All of this humanities experience has made my life so rich and I'm especially grateful to Humanities Montana and to the National Endowment for the Humanities for the challenges that you all set before us and the support that enables all of these different kinds of efforts that come from our community. Once again, thank you so much for this award. And to those who nominated me, I appreciate it. A whole, a whole, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Pease. You are such an inspiration to us all. At this point in the ceremony, I'd like to recognize what we have all surely already noticed. We are, for the first time in Humanities Montana's history, holding the Governor's Humanities Awards virtually. 
The COVID-19 pandemic has taken its toll on Montana for the better part of 18 months now. The state has suffered massive losses emotionally, psychologically, economically. We at Humanities, at Humanities Montana believe that part of battling that loss is supporting the places that give us respite and understanding, our public humanities organizations. Our public humanities partners, museums, historical societies, libraries, and cultural organizations across the state help Montanans ask, grapple with, and propose solutions to the toughest questions facing us in these times. With the financing of two federal stimulus packages, Humanities Montana has infused nearly a million dollars into the state's public humanities organizations since the summer of 2020. To help you visualize what this means for the state, here is a map of all the organizations who received grants funding from, our, from Humanities Montana through the CARES Act and the American Rescue Plan. As you can see, Humanities Montana's grants cover the breadth of the state, often in counties under financial duress and the most severely affected by the pandemic, as represented by the shading. With help from the NEH and generous donors like you, we worked hard so that Montana's public humanities organizations had relief when they needed it, as represented by the blue pins, and support as the state recovers represented by the green pins. We know how important the humanities are to Montana's communities. When you think about the public humanities, we hope you think of Humanities Montana. We want to share with you the impact of our sustaining the humanities through the American Rescue Plan grants on a community level. With us from the ex Extreme History Project is Crystal Alegria and our very own Kim Anderson, Director of Programs and Grants. Almost immediately after the country shut down with COVID in March of 2020, Humanities Montana undertook a statewide needs assessment to over 500 cultural organizations around the state just to find out what the needs were as we tried to prepare for the grants that would be coming our way. Respondents most frequently cited a loss of fundraising opportunities when they talked about the losses due to COVID. Other losses included having to lay off staff, having to shutter venues, and often a sense that they had lost touch with their constituents because they were unable to do programming. Extreme History's programming going into March of 2020 was all in person. Our lecture series was in person, our walking tours were in person, our workshops were in person. So when COVID came, we had to completely reconfigure everything that we did. We couldn't do any of our fundraisers in 2020. We couldn't do any of our walking tours, which is what sustains us and, and really supports our operations. In March, our Congress passed the American Rescue Plan, $1.9 trillion. Through that mechanism, we were given money to distribute in Montana. NEH did this, I think, because they know that we're on the front lines. We know our states. Um, we're uh, very familiar with the smallest, most rural museum or library in our state, and they trusted us to make sure that the funds got to the people who really needed it. When the SHARP grant came along in 2021, we decided to apply for it because we were affected in 2020, but things in 2021 are still far behind where we were. SHARP stands for Sustaining the Humanities Through the American Rescue Plan. The purpose and goals of our SHARP funding is to support cultural institutions within the state and help them recover from or respond to the COVID-19 pandemic. So this fall would have looked much different for the Extreme History Project if we didn't receive a SHARP grant. And the application was easy, it was fast, and the funding came very quickly. We would have had to really scale back, pull back on some of these projects and programs that we had started. It has also really helped us literally keep the lights on at Extreme History. We were able to pivot quickly and offer programs that were online, which we found were actually more accessible to a lot of people. 
we were able to develop our podcast fairly quickly and get that out to the public, which now we can reach a whole different demographic. Uh, we have an online book club, which we didn't even think about doing until, until COVID hit. It's fundamental for us as humans to understand where we've come from because history can give us identity. By understanding the long history of Montana, we can be better citizens. Then we can move forward together with that shared history in mind. What a tribute to the difference the humanities make in our lives and our communities. Thank you, Crystal and Kim. Our next Governor's Humanities Award winner is a journalist who has written for the New York Times for nearly four decades. Jim Robbins' work has appeared in the Boston Globe, Smithsonian Magazine, Scientific American, the Los Angeles Times, and many more prestigious publications. Jim reports on the intersection of the American West and scientific exploration and has authored or co-authored six books. His work on Montana's land management, wildlife, and conservation continues to guide generations of Montanans looking for answers to questions about the future. Jim, some of your biggest fans wanted to say something to you. He, um, he focuses on the frontiers of science and reminds us that despite how much as a society we currently understand about our world, um, that understanding is still dwarfed by how much we don't understand. And I think that speaks to the importance of humility and is really a, a core lesson for, for society. In my mind anyway, probably his greatest contribution has been the fact that he has explored a litany of issues uh, in the West and in Montana. And uh, uh, that f frankly underscore uh, the environmental issues and problems that, that this nation and this globe um, is grappling with right now and has taken them away out of Montana and out of this region and spread them all across the country through his writings to national publications. Before that, I think we owe Jim our gratitude and I thank him and I wish him uh, the best and congratulations on a well-deserving award. I just wanna say congratulations on this award, old friend. And um, it's well-earned and well-deserved and uh, you're a treasure to Montana and all its people. And I, I hope you keep on doing this and I hope to keep on working with you for many years to come. They're so impressed that Jim is a sort of a humble guy. Uh, and then to see all of a sudden be reading the New York Times and boom, there's a story by him. It's always been uh, very impressive and uh, it's a, a pleasure to, to know a guy like Jim. What's really special about the work that my dad does as a journalist um, and why specifically he deserves the Montana Governor's Humanity Award is even though I give him a really hard time sometimes for technically being an out-of-stater, um, whereas I'm a born Montanan, um, I think that he's done a really incredible job of taking interesting, important things that are happening in Montana and tying them into a national and sometimes even global larger narrative um, in a way that ends up highlighting important aspects of Montana, of framing a very unique Montana way of life, but also of, of connecting us to uh, the rest of the world, which is, I think, very important. Dad, I'm big time proud of you, and this is, this is truly a well-deserved award, but I'm still tougher. Well, if there's, there's one thing that you can say about Jim, it's that he's really tall. We've always thought he was really tall, especially for a, a person receiving a humanities award. Maybe too tall. <laughs> we believe there were some pretty tall recipients out of the history department in Missoula. I've just, you know, for all the years, I've, I've got a crook in my neck just looking up at the guy. He's really tall. He's taller than most. <laughs>
I used to play basketball with him, and he was tall then, too. Jim, it's so great that they've uh, decided that you finally get the humanity, Governor's Humanities Award. And I just want to say um, that uh, I've always been proud uh, to know you and uh, see your, your name and uh, read your writing. And, uh, but I really mostly want to say, I can't wait till the next time we get out on a big adventure. <laughs> well, that was quite a, a surprise on my end. Um, this whole adventure has been full of surprises. Um, pleasantly surprised, of course. Uh, I even had to look up the term humanities to, to realize precisely what it meant and how it applied to me. And when I did, I found I was right at home because they were the things that meant the world to me if by other names. I think in short, humanities are the best of who we are. And um, I'm happy to be honored in, in this way and to join this august group of people I have long admired and I only wish we could gather in person. An award like this is a pause for reflection. Uh, and in this case, it's a reflection on my Montana origin story. I'll, I'll go on just a little bit about this. I drove west from upstate New York with my wife, Cher, nearly a half century ago in a 1963 Ford Galaxy with bald tires and no seat belts fresh out of journalism school. We were adventuring across the vast Western landscape and not sure where we were headed and drove first to Texas. Well, it didn't take long to get Texas out of our system. And a few days later, we were headed north looking for a good place to settle. And the first place we found that we wanted to live was Helena. In my early years in Helena and a couple of years in Missoula, I painted houses and as I wrote and even worked for a short time at a Perkins cake and steak restaurant in Missoula. Builds character, as they say. A fateful meeting in the library here in 1980 with a woman who was giving up her role as a stringer for the New York Times led me to a connection with the incoming Denver correspondent for the Times, Bill Schmidt, who became a mentor. The next year, the managing editor of the paper, Arthur Gelb, who in those days, uh, that position was akin to royalty, came to Helena and also took me under his wing. So for the last 40 years, I've been honored to represent Montana in the world's finest newspaper, chasing good stories around the West and around Montana. From the Unabomber in Lincoln to the standoff with the Freeman in Jordan to the fires in Yellowstone in 1988, it has literally been a storied run. All from my little office above a candy store called The Parrot in downtown Helena. Most important to me, the most important stories to me though, are the lessons that Montana has to teach the world about living with nature. From grizzly bears and wolves to the microbes in Yellowstone hot pools to the impressive array of bird researchers and native trout in the rivers here. It's been my joy to join the stories, to report the stories from the front lines of a state where nature is an everyday part of the conversation. Awards like this are a team effort, and I want to say thank you very much to my my wife and my children, my mother and the rest of my family who made it all possible, my friends and associates, and of course, Humanities Montana and Governor Gianforti. So thank you. Thank you, Jim. Our next awardee is one of Montana's true great philanthropists. Though originally from just over the Wyoming border, Jim Scott has earned his title of Montanan through years of dedicated community involvement in the humanities across the state. Jim's on-the-ground approach to cultural understanding and exchange, particularly on Montana's reservations, has demonstrated the power of the humanities to generations of Montanans. We have invited some of Jim's closest friends and family here tonight to help us celebrate his lifetime of humanities work. What can I say except thank you for the leadership that you have shown. I think the business that you have run uh, has certainly 
carried on your philosophy about equitability, generosity, fairness, um, that all comes from your heart. But it is, is there's so much that, you know, people can talk about when they talk about Jim Scott, mostly is his warm smile and friendly sh handshake and his commitment to being with leaders for the long term. You know, one thing that we talked about was the vision of Henrietta Mann, who said that you ha have to be there for the seven generations. And that's a value and a principle that is very reflective of Jim Scott's work. Is Jim, you know, you've had a remarkable contribution to society, to business endeavors, to your family, uh, to all those things that I commented upon. And it's been a privilege to get to know you over the last several decades. And uh, I treasure you as, as a wonderful friend. Very interesting because I think a lot of times people win awards because they are great philanthropists. And Jim is a great philanthropist. but really the reason he deserved the, the award is the direction and the heart that he has put in to organizations and causes in Montana. The things that he cares about, he gets behind and support. Hi, favorite youngest brother. Uh, I'm so happy that you're receiving this award. You worked hard and educated deeply in the humanities, you have self-taught yourself and are just sensitive, responsive to, to the needs of other people, to their histories and their individuality. And I'm very, very proud of you for expanding the communication in the world in spite of it all. Thanks to friends and family. I would like to thank Humanities Montana for this award. Thanks to the governor and thanks to the nominators. This award is made most special by being in the company of the other honorees. Janine Pease has been a neighbor, friend and inspirer for decades. It was about 35 years ago that I got off the highway. I traveled thousands of times and visited Janine and Little Bighorn College for the first time. That launched one of the most important journeys of my life, learning the stories and character of the indigenous people who have inhabited this land for centuries. There is no one for whom I have more respect or admiration. I first met Dorothy Bradley in the late 80s. She was a leader for me who became the exemplar for courage, truth, and grace timeless leadership qualities. She challenged tired paradigms and attracted people of different perspectives. Spent many morning drives connecting with other verbivores through Christy the wordsmith's curiosity and voice into the words that make humanness alive and fun. And I'm sure that I've read Jim Robbins reporting over many years, but last week I was traveling and listen to his book, The Wonder of Birds, what they tell us about the world, ourselves, and a better future. Like most of us, I've always loved birds. Now I love and appreciate birds so much more. I love that book and Jim's brilliant mind. It's truly an honor to be included in this group. I believe I've inherited in my DNA a love for the landscape, history, and communities broadly defined that make up this region. In particular, from my mother, I received a love for beauty, joy, and justice. From my sister, I witnessed a life immersed in the love of humanities. And from my partner and wife for more than a half century, I've had someone to daily share the joys and challenges of being committed to this place its people, and the biodiversity that sustains us physically and spiritually. The need for appreciation of and motivation by the humanities has never been more evident. The difficult issues we face today as humans have never seemed greater, but maybe that's the nature of our existence. 
It is the understanding of our common humanness, our love for family, beauty, justice, and meaning that keep us moving forward through the challenges that are always present. It's the empathy and compassion for others that has always helped us move onward and upward. These better angels are so very necessary today. Thanks to Humanities Montana for reminding us and for helping us connect. Thanks. The final awardee of the 2021 Governor's Humanities Awards is an author of two books and a well-known Montana public radio host. Christy Smith has captivated Montanans for years, providing history and context for words and phrases through her daily two-minute broadcast, Christy the Wordsmith. The series is heard throughout Montana on various radio stations and worldwide on Armed Forces Radio and Television Network. Christy, we have a few of your friends with us this evening who would like to share how you have impacted their lives. You know, I think one of the things I'd like to say about Christy as, as an educator, she makes words interesting. Her presentations are just, you, you're drawn to her and you look forward to the next time. That's just a, a, a huge part of who she is and how she makes uh, words so interesting and how she's educated us through the years. Uh, Christy, this award is definitely well-deserved. Um, great person. Personally, she was a very good friend to me at a time when I needed a very good friend. Um, she has a lot of good qualities, super good qualities. And I like her work because, you know, I myself have a tendency to get lost in a dictionary. I think those of us who read, you know, you look at one word and then you turn around and you find about 27 more. So listening to her show on the radio is always fun. And you think, how come I didn't know that? Or was I supposed to know that? Or look how many words there are that we never use. We have an incredible vocabulary and yet we're all pretty limited. So I'd like to thank Christy for just making us aware of the fact that it is a huge vocabulary and maybe we should study it a little more. Christy is, is somebody who's, who's important for my life and was also, as I mentioned before, was incredibly important for, for, my, for my mom's life. I think, that, um, I think that seeing yourself as kind of a maverick as my mom did can, can feel special, but it can also be isolating. And, um, and I think that the, that the community that the Christie has built and supported and is a part of um, in Montana is, is really, really remarkable. I actually, I was looking this morning, I still, my mom passed away 13 years ago, um, but I found this picture that my mom kept of her and Christy in her car. And for some reason, I still know that, I think this was up at Madison Buffalo Jump. Um, I don't know why I know that, but I just remember that for some reason. I might be wrong, but, um, but just the, you know, the impact um, for me as a, as an academic growing up and having, having these women as role models is incredibly profound um, and meaningful. And I'm, I just think this award is so deserving. I'm so excited for Christy um, and I'm so honored to have been able to provide a tribute. So a few years ago, I uh, had the opportunity to watch Christy uh, wordsmith the word chiasmus. And uh, in a nutshell, a chiasmus is a figure of speech in which the grammar of one phrase is inverted in the following phrase. And so, uh, for example, Gandhi said, live simply so that others can simply live. Uh, John F. Kennedy said, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. And I have a chiasmus for Christy the wordsmith. Christy, you bring words to our life and life to our words. Thank you. Congratulations on your well-deserved award. You're awesome. I so wish that our event could be live so I could meet and hug and or elbow bump uh, my remarkable fellow humanities awardees, Janine and Jim and Dorothy 
and Jim. But on the other hand, the online platform enables our distant friends and relatives to join us for this occasion who otherwise couldn't come to Montana. So hello, cousins. And I would like to say kudos to the Humanities Montana staff for engineering this pioneering event. You know, there was a lot of hard work and strategizing and not a little bit of trepidation involved. Um, I'd also like to thank Governor Gianforte for his remarks on behalf of the humanities. In the last dozen years or so, as I've grown into my radio broadcast, Christy the Wordsmith, I've often reflected on a sentiment attributed to many uh, thinkers, but most recently and most reliably to the American theologian and writer named Frederick Beekner. And here I'll paraphrase for the sake of brevity. He wrote, where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger and curiosity merge, there lies your calling. This idea has been my North Star for several years um, because my deep gladness is seeking and revealing the hidden lives of English language words and phrases, and then sharing, literally broadcasting those fascinating stories. And I found that many people have a real curiosity and a real hunger for that same information so it's my mission to provide it for those who don't have the time or the resources or the inclination to chase it because they're busy fostering their own deep gladnesses and that's exactly the way it should be well doing what makes a person glad while meeting the needs of others is not all beer and skittles you have to be real Keeping a radio broadcast like Christy the Wordsmith viable requires uh, support from others. And I have it from Zoot Enterprises and Chris Nelson and the Gilhausen Family Foundation and Brian and Sally Barker and Tim Crawford. And I especially want to thank uh, the staff at Montana Public Radio and, uh, or excuse me, uh, Yellowstone Public Radio, Montana Public Radio. And of course, to Bozeman's own free form radio facility, KGLT, that 31 years ago took a chance on the idea of a series about words and enabled somebody like me with no radio experience to plunge right in. So thank you to all the past and present staff at KGLT for that remarkable opportunity. In the early 2000s, I was a member of Humanities Montana Speakers Bureau, which enabled writers and historians and musicians and civic leaders and word lovers to crisscross the state to share the deep joy of their specialties. My Speakers Bureau travels took me literally from Plentywood to Big Sky, from Libby to Miles City, where I met Montanans who love the language and love dictionaries and who are engaged with family linguistic traditions. And my conversations with them were inspirational and deeply gratifying. My Speakers Bureau years were so exquisitely timely in my personal and vocational development, I would not be the same wordsmith without them. So, I'm grateful to receive this award from Humanities Montana. It's like coming around full circle. I salute my fellow awardees, and I thank those involved in my nomination progress pro process. Thank you so much. And uh, to echo the chiasmus that Tano Mayo mentioned a few moments ago, it is my deep gladness to bring words to your life and life to your words. Farewell. Thank you, Christy. Tonight, we are honored to celebrate an amazing group of Montana's public humanities advocates. These five awardees demonstrate the strength and resilience of the public humanities in our state.
The humanities help us come together as communities, give us the language to articulate and analyze the most pressing questions, and provide the tools for our communities to propose solutions. The humanities teach us to think differently, incorporate new ideas, and build our own conclusions. Most importantly, the humanities help us learn how to talk to each other. They beg us to interrogate our past and present and inspire us to construct a future by where we have been and who we want to be as individuals, communities, and a state. Our honorees tonight are exemplars of how the humanities bring out the best in our state and its citizens. Humanities Montana is proud to present the 2021 Governor's Humanities Awards to such a deserving cohort. From everyone at Humanities Montana, thank you for being with us this evening. We hope we will all be gathering together in person again soon. One of the unintended consequences of us gathering virtually tonight is that this ceremony, and by extension, these brilliant awardees, were able to be broadcast throughout Montana and beyond. One of our priorities at Humanities Montana is to overcome barriers, economic and geographic, to reach all Montanans, from Mile City to Missoula. We are happy to share this celebration of the public humanities with all Montanans. Let's bring Carla back on stage to take a look at a map of where our audience is tuning in from tonight. This is the community of fabulous people who are watching with us right now. Thank you for believing the humanities do have the power to spark important conversations and build communities. If you are as inspired as I am, I hope you'll find the time to visit one of our 56 counties. We have historic sites and cultural centers across the state. Go to a place you've never been before or find a way to have a conversation with someone who's different from you. And when you think of the public humanities, think of Humanities Montana. Thank you to all of our generous sponsors and donors who made this evening possible. Your support means more than words can say. Laura Mitchell Ross and John Walker Ross, David and Jan Dietrich, Caroline and Don Bitts, the Montana History Foundation, Preserve Montana, Rocky Mountain College, Carla Homestead, Montana Public Radio, and Montana PBS. Thank you, and good night.